would say, bro. I was going to say, Brother Clark, uh, it's, is it possible that it's you know, when you suppress the Holy Spirit, you don't allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life to be u- used in a way that would be pleasing and acceptable to God? Amen. Amen. You're not allowing the Holy Spirit to be your guide. You have taken the place of Jesus Christ. You have put yourself on the throne. You are suppressing your spiritual guide. You won't allow your spiritual guide to guide you according to God's will. Everybody was right. So let's take a look at question number one. Question number one on page 29. Question number one on page 29. But before we get there, the first part of the question is, think about the people in your life. How many lie, How many are living with some form of oppression? So for a moment, think about the people in your life and how many are living with some form of oppression. But first, let's take a look at what the dictionary defines the word of oppression to mean. Oppression to mean prolonged cruel or unjust treatment or control, an unjust or excessive exercise of power. You can identify with that. Now let's take a look at what is the definition of Human oppression. Oppression refers to combination of prejudice and institutional power that creates a system that regularly and severely discriminates against some group and benefits other groups. We can identify with that. What does oppression mean in the Bible? In your own words, what does oppression mean in the Bible? Kind of like the same thing, but in your own words. Sister Shannon. Their manner. Amen. They were uh, exploited. They had no freedom. Uh, they could not choose. Um, they were um, systematically harmed for the purpose of the of the oppressor, because there's a difference in being oppressed and being suppressed. Okay. So in the Bible, that's that's what oppression was. Was it was it was the exploitation? They exploited the, the uh, they exploited God's people. Amen. They forced them to work against their will, even even to the point where they had to make their own bricks. So. Mm. Funny you should mention that. Let's back up what Sister Shannon just said. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 14. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 14. Can someone read Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 14? And then someone, would you please get uh, 2 Kings Chapter 3, verse 26, and we'll read all the way to 4 1. You have one, one, uh, what's that, verse 14? 114. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. Uh, uh, that's, that's Exodus. That's Ecclesiastes. Yeah. I meant Exodus. I'm sorry. <laughs> Exodus. I'm sorry. Exodus. Exodus chapter 1, verse 14. And this goes uh, directly with what Sister Shannon was just uh, talking about. Uh, 
And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in the in which they made them serve was with rigor. So that's a heavy burden laid on some right? So that that was uh, how could I say it? it was constructive. It was organized. That was organized suppression. Just like in some ways uh, today, you know, there's organized suppression in our lives. Can we agree, Brother Branch, you agree with that? Amen. Second Kings uh, chapter 3, verse 26. Anyone have that? Uh, chapter Second Kings chapter three, verse twenty six to forty one. No, I think there is. Anybody? Second Kings chapter three. Get it. Twenty six. Verses twenty six. Yeah, all the way to uh, chapter four, verse one. Okay. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him, he took with him 700 men who drew swords to break through to break through to the king of Edom, but they could not. When he, then he took his eldest son, who had reigned in his place, and offered him as a burnt offering unto, upon the wall, and there was a great indignation against Israel. So they departed from him and returned to their own land. A certain woman... Now here we go. Go ahead, my brother. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Amen. Can you imagine that? Man, if that's not oppression, then what is? When somebody is threatening to take your family, can we identify with that today? Of course we can. Let me come back over here. Can we identify that? Can we identify, excuse me, with that today? Someone coming to take your family. What kind of oppression is that? Mm. Some of y'all work for the, the social workers. What is that? The people who come and take people's kids. What is that? What, what's the name of it? Social, social services? Social services. Can you imagine that oppression, that system, that system that is, that is designed to take people's kids? Am I right or wrong? That system is primarily designed to take people's kids. That's, it, doesn't, it doesn't always turn out that way, but the, the, the system is designed for the safety of the children. And I'll use the little boy in Columbus whose mother was, was uh, schizophrenic that left him in that drain. You know, that just happened. Social services should have been called in when they knew the woman had uh, a psychiatric problem. You know, and then that child probably would have been removed from that home and been alive today. Amen. So the, 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 it, sounds, it sounds crass, but the purpose, and it's not, it doesn't always work, but the purpose of that service is the safety of the child. If they're in an environment where it's not safe for them, or you got people taking care of them for the wrong reasons. A few years ago, they had a couple that were taking care, taking care of kids, and they had them in cages in the bedroom. Eight Amen. of them. Those children should have been removed from that house, and they were when they when they found out. So that there is a there is a good purpose for doing it. It's not set to to just take people's kids. You know. Okay. You take but there's also a bad side of that. There's a bad side to everything, but the purpose of the of the original uh, purpose of it was to remove kids to a safer environment. Okay. It does not always work. So I know this guy who is a social worker. 
He was a social worker for a long time. His name is Mr. Charles Bridges. During our conversation of him being a social worker, that's what he told me, that the system was designed to work against you, basically, and not for you. He talked about how he used to go to people's homes and see their situation. And he used to have to uh, kind of like lead and guide them in a manner that social services wouldn't take their kids. Because if he went to them exactly the way that, how could I say it, that the parents were talking or, or how could I say it, the situation they were in, it was designed to take away their kids. So there's a good side, and there is a bad side. The thing that we're looking at is oppression. We're talking about oppression. And oppression can be harsh. So before we, we get to the question, we're talking about oppression. What different types of oppression is there? You know, there's a lot of different types of oppression. So somebody in this section, just, just give me one type of oppression. Amen. Financial struggles, that's oppression. You had one, Brenda? Okay. Any, anybody else? Psychological. Psychological. My brother, Amen. Anybody in this section? All, all different types of oppression. Going once, twice, over there, my sister. What'd you say? Unjust, unjust treatment. Unjust treatment. Amen. That's what oppression is. It's part of it. Anybody over here? There's different forms of oppression. Just think about your life. Anybody over here? Oh, come on, Brenda. You work down at City Hall. <laughs> Going once, twice. All right. Physical. Physical oppression. Amen. You know, I kind of missed something too. Let me let me back out uh, just a minute. Let's talk about how oppression affects us mentally. Anybody over here? Out of your own words, with your own words, brother and sister. Sister Ewing, I saw you shaking your head. Here come the mic. You know, I know we got some healthcare workers in here, right? You just have to say that. Okay, all right. Well, that's good too. Uh, what's your question? How does how the uh, oppression affects us mentally? I mean, it could be, you know, harshly. You know what I'm saying? You gotta go through what you're going through, and then, you know, through prayer and all that, you can come out on the other side. You know, better, bigger, and stronger. Amen. But yeah, it can definitely affect you know you emotionally and everything. If uh, you know if you're going through something, I don't know, a bad marriage or financial struggles, all those things, you know. There's homelessness, a bunch of stuff that can hey affect man. you. You reading the harshly. You reading the notebook, right? Well, I'm not reading <laughs> anything. Okay. I'm reading my mind. Hey Amen. <laughs> I was gonna say, you know, mentally, when you're depressed, you're you you're not doing your normal things that you would normally do. Um, you're you're bedridden. You know, you're you're uh, sad. You're you know, I suffer from depression. It, every so often, and it just throws me off my game. You don't do your normal uh, stuff that you want. You don't have the energy or the, uh, the desire to want to do what you would normally do, okay? Amen. Anybody else over here? Anybody over here? Yes. My brother. 
I was going to say, we're working with someone now that has mental health issues, and uh, every time that person speaks to us, we try to encourage, and especially Tange, uh, giving God's word. Uh, but it, it not only discourages us because it's like a spirit of self-pity, which that's only the work of Satan. And we told him, it's like, until you come to understand the word of God and see how allow him to work in your life, uh, you're going to be in a constant state of just a recycling of depression, which he's been in for a couple years now, and it's never anything positive when we speak, and we try to stay encouraging, but it's always, oh, woe is me. And it's, it comes to a point where I was like, you know, you got to do something about it because it's bringing us that discouragement So and kind of oppressing us from you know, being better, uh, you know, positive in his life. Amen, my brother. Amen. Brother Hupon. A lot of, <coughs> a lot of your isms, you know, the forms of oppression, you know, like uh, uh, sexism, mm -hmm. uh, racism. Amen. Anti-Semitism, anti mm. ageism, bunch of isms. Amen. Amen. Let me come back over here. Racial oppression. Can somebody give me an example of racial oppression? <laughs> I mean, you know, this is, you know, we're just talking now. <laughs> racial. Well, give me an example well, of racial. I mean, you know, you, you know, you can't live where you want to live, and it's of course that's not as prevalent now as it used to be. But you know, when they you hear about a former um, president who wouldn't allow, you know, basically it was racism. He didn't want certain people um, of a certain race in his properties. You know what I'm saying? So that's racism. Um, not being allowed to live where you want to live, you know, being paid more um, in your salary just because of the col color of your skin, even though you, you know, could be the most qualified, but you know, mm. you they're looking yep. at your skin color or maybe your name versus your skills and abilities. Amen. So you just answered the other question, economics. When you talked about not being paid. <laughs> okay, let's look at gender based. Somebody in this section. Gender based. What is gender based oppression? You know, in your own words. Gender based oppression. She said it too. You know, she covered a kind of a lot of stuff. Very simple. Men make more money than women. Amen. Amen. We don't have a problem with that, do we, brothers? Huh? <laughs> All right. Man, anybody else? Gender based. You know, we could think about sports and uh, sports is a big one. Authoritarian. Authoritarian oppression. Right in this section. In your own words, what is authoritarian oppression? I'm the man, and you're going to do what I say. Anybody? Well, that's basically it. You know, I, I'm the man, you're going to do what I say. They use their authority to, you know, pretty much. Hey Amen. They use their authority in the wrong way. To rule. Conveniently. Huh, sister? Okay, start over. I'm sorry. I said I wanted to go back to agenda. Um, agen yes. Because they pushing their thoughts on kids now. They, you got to, they could change their sex. They could do whatever they want. And they supposed to be, you know, um, you can't even watch a TV show, kids show, without one of those um, kids being gay. So it's kind of really... Um, hard when you have to teach these 
our children that this is wrong, but society is trying to make us say it's not. So that's social oppression, you know, pressuring the kids to come out and, and be gay. Yeah, that's a big one. You know, it's a, it's a big thing that's up in the air about um, sports. Say it, Tanya. Sister Tanya. now about the sports that where the, the girls can play football or the boys can play other, you know, they're switching their sports off where they're trying to make it legal where they can go on and qualify or try to play that sport as if they're that sex and they're actually not. Just like the bathrooms now, you know, you have to have the bathroom for both of them. And truly, I don't want to go in the restroom and see a man. Mm. I don't think children should have to go in the ba restroom. If they're little girls, they shouldn't have to see men or boys in their restroom. But now they're trying to make it so that can happen. Amen. Amen. A man playing in a female sport is still a man playing in a female sport. And he's much stronger. Amen. Next one. Racial, economic, class-based, gender-based, authoritarian, and social oppression in general often intersect in many different ways and coexist with opposite forms of privilege to create novel and unique forms of oppression. Voters' rights. Coexist, right? You're being oppressed, but yet still, you know, they claim that you have voting rights, which we, we do have voting rights, but that, that suppression or oppression is still upon us to try to keep us from voting. That's it, so I just threw that out there. Now let's take a question, let's, excuse me, let's take a look at question Number one on page 29. Question number one on page 29. Can someone read question number one on page 29? And we talked about all this, you know, just to get an idea of oppression. Think about the people in your life. How many are living with some forms of oppression? What advice would you give them to help them alleviate this burden? Amen. So we thought about the people that's in our lives. And then the people that's in your life, just general speaking, how, how many people would you say out of uh, 10 people is living in some form of oppression? Anybody over here? My sister. Out of 10 people that you know. It, it could be all 10. Hey, Amen. May have some oppression <laughs> of any, any type at any time. Hey, Amen. Wow. I guess that just covered it right there. But that part, here's the good part. Let me come over here. What advice would you give them to help alleviate their burden? What advice would you give a person? What advice would you give a person that you know was being oppressed to help them? How could I say it? Uh, ease the burden of being oppressed. Anybody over here? Let me come over here, Sister Ivy. I just think about the conversations that I've had with my son over the past year of being a, um, a young black man and the things that he's gone through. I just try to tell him that he needs to uh, get back into the word and to pray and to trust God. And coming from his mother, saying that over and over again may not sound, you know, he might want to hear more, but that's all I got to give him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, as being a black, young black man going through 
Gucci. That's what I think about. Amen. Brother Conley, what advice would you give them to help reduce this burden? And I'm not saying I've been through like a whole bunch of depression or slavery or nothing, but I still think it's a state of mind. I mean, people can be physical. You can't change other people. People go say and do what they want to do, but you can change your reaction to what they say and do. Amen. So you can act crazy. You can, and you can just be like, you know, say something positive when they come negative and just move on with life. You can't mm -hmm. change them. Mm -hmm. You can only change how you view the situation. Amen. Well said. Sister Jean. Whenever a person or someone's going through, I mean, we want to pray for them first and foremost, but also help them to, you know, seek spiritual guidance and, you know, because God can help with any type of depression, mm -hmm. um, whether it's depression, financially, physically, anything, his word conquers all of that. And if we get into his word, or we help them to see his word for whatever situation that they're going through. Now say that again. Help them to see. Whatever situation that they're going through. Help them to see God's word. Right. Whatever situation they are going through. Because God can help you through any type of oppression, whatever, whatever you're going through. Amen. His word is there to help and guide you. But we don't seek that first. We seek help in other things, other people, mm -hmm. counselors, medicine, whatever the case is. But we don't seek him first. Mm -hmm. And he's the physician, the great physician. He's the, the counselor. He's everything. Amen. But if we seek him first, then a lot of those trips to other people and other resources, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have to go through or go to. Amen. Amen. So one of the key things, well, a lot of the key things he said was prayer, pray first, and help them see God's word, whatever the situation is. You don't necessarily have to quote scripture, you know, because a lot of times, especially if you're not, if you're not talking to a Christian, you know, they don't want to hear you quoting scripture. But still, you can tell them what that, that scripture means without quoting it uh, word by word. You can speak to them in a general way. Over here. Yeah, I just wanted to say the, um, the advice that I recently, in the conversation that I recently had with someone, uh, my advice, other than the spiritual aspect, was please don't give up. Amen. Amen. We'll take a look at that as well. So what does the Bible say about it, my brother? You know, oppression is a big thing. It's, it's funny you said that. I was just about to say Luke 23, 34, mm -hmm. when Christ said, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus didn't do nothing to nobody mm -hmm. bad, and they oppressed him. Nothing. He didn't do nothing to nobody. Amen. And he still said, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And that's Luke 23, 34. Amen. And if Jesus went through oppression, guess what? We're going to experience some oppression too. Right. I also have, can someone read? Well, we read this last, last week. Uh, Sister Shannon read it for us. But Psalms 9, 1. I mean, Psalms 99. The Lord is my refuge for the oppressed. Wait a minute. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in the time of trouble. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> also in Isaiah 54, 14, in righteousness you will be established. Tyranny will be far from you. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed. It will not come near you. And we have Psalms uh, chapter 55 verse 20 and Psalms chapter 62 verse 8. So oppression is a big thing y'all. And we just have to learn to deal with it 
no matter what the situation is, looking, looking at it through the eyes of Christ Jesus. Sister Debbie, we don't want to deal with it on our own terms. You know, we don't want to go out there and be ourselves dealing with oppression because, oh, Sister Debbie, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, we have to have our eyes open sometimes too because sometimes there's a spousal abuse going on and they're covering it up because they're ashamed of it. They're made to be feel little. But if you know that it's going on, or once you, they finally say something, you have to help them Amen. physically in that situation. And sometimes you risk your own life because by doing that. But wow. you have to go to court every time they're at in court because you have to be, if that person that you're helping, they're not strong enough until they see you step up and be strong enough to stand up against this person. Mm -hmm. And maybe be the first woman to stand up against this man. Because I personally had this ha happen with my daughter. He was amazed that I was at court every single little time that they called it. And I was the first woman that ever stood up to him, and he was shocked by it. Amen. Hold on to that mic, Sister Debbie. Um, <laughs> make sure that you don't, how can I say it, uh, have a relationship as to uh, looking to marry somebody who was, who was a control freak. Just make sure you don't do that. But Sister Debbie, what did you what did you tell me the other day about cardboard? About what? Cardboard. What you do with cardboard? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, yesterday we was talking and you said that you you cardboard. Do cardboard. You don't remember? Uh oh. <laughs> you know something about uh. Um, oh oh oh! I know what I was saying. Okay. That you know we all get so many boxes, and when you're really frustrated or really upset. Don't use a uh, cutter and cut it up. Rip it up with your hands. And it's amazing Amen. how you can feel so much better just mm. by ripping up that box. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So Sister Debbie is, is telling us when you know when you feel oppressed, go out and tell something. <laughs> that's not what she's saying. <laughs> but you know, it's amazing that that's what some people do. Some people uh, bust out people's car windows. Some people slash their tires. Some people ride in the street. Some people attack the White House. You know, it's just amazing. You know what that pressure could do to people. Even if, you, even if you're right or wrong, that pressure, that oppression can make you do some strange things. And another good thing for uh, oppression or when you're feeling depressed is we talked about uh, how you step on those bubbles, you know those plastic bubbles? You step on them and they pop, you know? I wonder why is that? You know, why is tying up something, ripping up cardboard or stepping on a bubble, you know? Well, I said that, you know, it just relieves you. Can somebody you know, explain that? Why, why it just relieves you, you know? You, you tearing up cardboard, stepping on the bubble. Better you do that than go out and ride in the street. Let's take a look at, someone read question number two. Okay, we're going to try to hurry up. Question number two. Page 29. Jesus told his disciples that he was going to, going away and that he would send a comfort, uh, excuse me, he would send another comforter. Who is the other comforter and how can we oh, you receive know, I'm him? I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Did we ever find an answer in the workbook? Oh, okay, let's find an answer in the workbook for question number one, I'm sorry. 
Where's, where can the answer be found in the workbook for question number one? Sorry, Tanya. Where can the answer be found in your workbook for question number one? Does anybody have it? Think about the people in your life, how many are living with some forms of oppression. What advice would you give them to help alleviate this burden? Does anybody have it? Well, I tell you, it was kind of, you know, tough to really, you know, exactly pinpoint it. And I myself came up with a few. But for the sake of time, let's just take a look at page 25. And can someone read where it says, and then we have our own personal encounter? Sister Tanya. <coughs> and then we have our own personal encounters with oppression. Think about it. What is it for you? Is it poverty, homelessness, divorce, a bad marriage, unemployment, fear, or hurt? Perhaps you have named, excuse me, perhaps you have not named it yet, but it is there lurking in the recesses of your mind, keeping you from letting God in and receiving your comfort. Solomon wanted to understand how oppression affects us. What is it, excuse me, what is it that will cause us to feel as if we are physically suffocating and mental or spiritual burdens? See Ecclesiastics 3.16, 4, 5, 8. Okay, maybe you can read that on your own time. Anybody else? I, like I said, we had a few spots, but we'll, we'll just stick with that one for the time being. Okay, question number two. Can someone read question number two? Yes, Sister Tanya. Question number two, I'm sorry. Question number two, Jesus told his disciples that he was going away and that he would send another comforter. Who is the other comforter and how can we receive him? Amen. So who is this other comforter? How can we receive him? Jesus then left. So who is this other comforter? Amen. I want them over here to say something. <laughs> Y'all be knowing the answer, but won't speak up. What's up with that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. So how can we receive him? Who said that? My sister? Amen. That's good. So where can the answer be found in our workbooks? Page 47, oh, 27, I'm sorry. <laughs> Page 27, can you, you got your book, book? You want to read that for us, my brother? Um, I got the cornerstone. Jesus is our comforter. He died for all of us. Jesus told his disciples that he was going away and that he would send another comforter. The other comforter, Jesus is speaking of is the spirit of truth known as the Holy Ghost. We receive this comforter when we obey the gospel, repent of our sins, and are baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of our sins. Jesus invites us to come to him, and he will provide for us the solace we desire. He is capable of giving us comfort. Amen. Amen. Does anybody have any supporting scriptures for that? Jesus is our confidence. Holy Spirit is our confidence. Any supporting scriptures for that? Anybody? Okay. Psalms 34, 18 reads, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Psalms 23, 4, 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. All praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the source of every mercy and the God who comforts us. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Amen. Uh, we're about getting ready to wrap up. But before we wrap up, uh, let's talk about, you know, ways that we can comfort others. Anybody, you know, just off the top of your head, ways that we can comfort others. Sister Brenda. Then I'm going to come over here. Ways that we can comfort others. Prayer and a uh, attentive listening ear. Attentive listening ear. Well, that's really important. Anybody else? Ways that we can comfort others. My sister. I like to send cards. Send cards. Amen. Sister Tanya. Share some scriptures with them. Share some scriptures with them. Amen. Anybody over there? Go ahead, Sister Bruce. Oh, I was just going to say you can comfort someone by taking them out. Taking them out. Amen. <laughs> Any other ways that we could comfort others? We fast together, pray together, share scriptures together, go out together, and just be attentive to each other's um, problems. Amen. I'm sorry, I was trying to find something for Brother Yukon. Um, you know, I, I just want to try to get the song right. And Brother Yukon said he know it. Ninety-two, because everybody turned to page ninety-two. You know, I just want to try to get this song right. You know, before we close it out. Ninety-two, brother Allen, I know you know the song. Can you help us out? Page ninety-two. 